All right, it is 634 and as I promised, we're going to get started now. Uh, thank you so much for being with us this evening. This is certainly a strange time to be joining a new school. So we want to try to use this evening to make sure that that transition is as seamless as possible for you. So what we'll be covering tonight before we get started, um, one thing to just keep in mind is that Many of the things, and actually most of the things we're going to be covering are also in the distance learning handbook, which we sent to you as a PDF. Um, so we recently made some updates. Uh, we actually just updated one thing yesterday. We'll talk about a slight change we had to make in our schedule. But many of the slides this evening and many of the things that I'll be covering um, are in our distance learning handbook. So if there's anything that is confusing to you this evening, or if you feel like I'm moving a little bit too fast, realize that this information can also be reviewed at a later time uh, here in the Distance Learning Handbook. And we are also recording this orientation, which we will post on the school's YouTube page tomorrow and also send you the link in case you need to go back and review any of the information that's being presented to you. So there are four of us on the call this evening from VIP High School's leadership team. My name is Michael Horn. Um, that's me in the upper left there. Uh, I'm the principal. And what I'll be talking to you about this evening is just an overview of our distance learning program, um, why we came up with the structure we did, how we incorporated both your and our returning families feedback to refine what we did in the spring and make a lot of improvements. I'll also be going over some of the technical aspects of how to use Google Classroom and Google Meet. These are the two platforms that are our primary way of delivering the distance learning experience. So I'll be doing a couple of demonstrations for you uh, just so that I've seen actually many of the incoming students have already figured out how to access their emails, which is great. Um, but if you haven't figured it out just yet, I'm going to show you how to do it this evening. Finally, especially since you're newer families, you probably have questions or you're gonna have various needs that are going to need to be addressed. So I'm going to go over who to contact for certain issues. So I'm going to put up a slide that kind of tells you the different people at the school that you should contact depending on the issue that you have. Um, and that way it'll kind of streamline communications for you and you'll make sure you're reaching out to the right people. That's gonna be the majority of the evening. And then I'm going to throw it to our assistant principal, Catherine Wilbert, who will update you on some issues related to AP exams, our AP programs at VIP High School, including the launching of the AP Capstone program, some issues related to GPA um, and how we calculate that, and finally, some issues related to advisory. After Catherine speaks, our executive director, Ann Cochran, is going to jump on and talk a little bit about our college mission and vision. This is the reason the school exists, and so we want to make sure you realize, um, in case you didn't attend any of the info sessions or open houses we had throughout the spring and even earlier on, um, that you understand what the school is all about. Like, why are you coming here? Ultimately, what do we think we can do for your child after their four years? And she's also going to speak a little bit about special education as it relates to distance learning. Finally, our academic counselor, Stephanie Riley, will speak about some practical issues of office hours, counseling appointments, um, how we plan to, cover, um, plan to cover graduation requirements for all of our students, how to make schedule change requests, and then we'll end the evening with some frequently asked questions that we've been getting over the past week or two. So these are the common questions we've compiled that seem to be asked by multiple families. And even if the question that you have doesn't show up on that screen, you can always reach out to us at info at VIPHS.org with any other questions that aren't addressed this evening. So by now, I'm sure that many of you have seen this uh, graphic or this sort of a, a display that shows you what the weekly sequence looks like for distance learning at VIP High School. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we arrived at this model, why it is set up the way that it is, and how we think it's going to best serve students during distance learning and ensure uh, continuity of education and instruction. So beginning next week on Monday, we're gonna launch, we're gonna jump right in and all of our students are gonna be logging into Google Meet in order to receive instruction from all of their classes. And during this presentation, I'm going to show you how students are going to do that. But what we've designed here is a model where each week is essentially in each class going to be about a major concept or an education, what we call an anchor standard. 
So a major idea or concept from the discipline that's going to be expanded on over the course of the week. So Mondays, uh, the classes are 45 minutes um, and it's really going to be, you know, Mondays are going to be teacher centered. There's going to be a lot of instruction. Um, there's going to be chances for interaction, of course, but that's going to be a part of the week where the teachers are very much in charge. Now, Tuesdays are primarily an independent study day, um, but we've also added in a 15 minute advisory. Um, that's a change we've had to make in the last couple of days. Um, and we'll talk about the actual schedule here in a minute. Now, another major initiative we have for distance learning this fall is to really expand the opportunities for student interaction, discussion, and application of knowledge. So on Wednesday and Thursday, we run a block schedule where half of the classes, half of a student's classes will meet on Wednesday and the other half will meet on Thursday. Those classes are longer and we've been working with teachers over the past week in professional development to really implement a variety of tools and platforms and apps that are going to make that a more interactive experience than what many students experienced in the fall. I'm sorry, in the spring. Finally, at the end of the week, um, after their classes on Wednesdays and Thursdays, students will receive what we call extension assignments. Now, the idea here is at this point, the student has received instruction from their teacher. They've had practice with that information on Tuesday. They've had further practice on their class on Wednesday or Thursday. They've had interaction with their peers. They've had time to co-construct knowledge. And finally, they're going to move on and then deepen their understanding independently. Now in the spring, you know, you weren't with us, but in the spring, we had all of the due dates being at the end of the week. But because we are expanding the amount of time that students are interacting with their teachers, the due dates for all of those assignments will be Monday morning the following week. Now, despite that extension of the due dates, um, we do believe that it's very reasonable for students to finish all of their di distance learning for the week before their weekend, as long as they're managing their time wisely Monday through Friday. Now, the reason that we ended up with this model where students aren't seeing their every teacher every day is it's based on what we call in education a gradual release of responsibility. And that model underlies pretty much all effective lesson planning and unit planning um, and teaching. And what it does is the idea is that over the course of a lesson or over the course of a sequence, um, the responsibility for learning is gradually shifted from the teacher to the student. So on Monday, the teacher, it is very much responsible and in charge of learning. They're going to be instructing, they're going to be demonstrating, they're gonna be providing these focus lessons that essentially amount to I, the teacher, do it. I'm going to show, you, show it to you. Let me show you this new information. The middle of the week, Tuesday through Thursday, is really about starting to gradually shift that onto the part of the students. So the Tuesday assignments are generally going to be practice or preparation for classes on Wednesday and Thursday. So it's this idea of we, the students, are now doing it. The classes on Wednesday and Thursday are really focusing and trying to be a collaborative experience where students do what we call the co-construction of knowledge. They're building their new understandings together. And that's that idea of you do it together. And finally, at the end of their classes, they receive those assignments and on Friday, is this idea of now you do it. So we have gone from I do, to we do, to you do. And so each week is meant to be its own logical sequence where over the course of the week, the responsibility for learning is gradually shifted onto the students with a variety of supports to go along with that. Now I wanted to share some of the survey results um, to just kind of talk a little bit more about how we arrived at this because distance learning obviously is new for many people. Um, and there might be a question of, well, why aren't students seeing every teacher every single day? Well, for one, when we asked the question to both you and our returning families, how many days a week do you think would be ideal? Um, the majority of the survey responses arrived at, as you can see, about three days a week. The next largest group said four days a week. Um, but in distance learning and in online education in general, it's important to have a couple of days each week for students to really have time to do independent work. So we found that model of Monday, Wednesday, Thursday for the academic classes, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for advisory for extra support makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's sort of where we arrived at that and it's what our families have really been telling us they kind of prefer. 
Now, this second question we didn't ask you because you weren't with us in the spring, but what you'll notice is that the majority of our families, about 64%, said the amount of work that was being assigned to students was just about right. Um, but there was a pretty significant minority of 28% who said, you know what, it wasn't rigorous enough, it was too little. And I still think that that was the right thing to do because we were erring on the side of caution. It was such an abrupt shift. Um, but with this new model, we think it's going to make sure that even more people are happy with the amount of work. Now, something we were very pleased to see is that during the spring, our returning families, this is uh, one of their survey results, um, over 90% of them said that the opportunities for support were exceptional um, or adequate. So even though our families were pretty happy that, with that, we've actually expanded the opportunities for support and standardized them. So on Tuesdays and Fridays, teachers are holding office hours on a set schedule so that any student who needs help from any other teachers is going to have the time to carve that out. So our history departments will be holding open up, I'm sorry, office hours on Tuesdays and Fridays at 10 a.m. Our math department will be Tuesdays and Fridays at 11, it says p.m., that's a mistake, obviously. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> math is 11 a.m. Our English department will be in the afternoon at 1, followed by science and Spanish, and then the arts at 3. So if your students end up finding on those independent study days that they need to talk to their teacher or get extra help, that opportunity is still there, even though it's not mandatory. So this is what our weekly schedule looks like. And those two things in red are the recent changes that we had to make. So on Mondays, what you'll notice is school will start at 8.30. Each class will be 45 minutes long. Lunch is a generous hour. We want to make sure students have a nice break in the middle of the day and we'll wrap up around 310. Now, if you're any of those students that have already figured out how to open your emails and, and have been invited to your Google Classrooms, you'll notice that most students do not actually take seven classes. So somewhere in there, most students are also going to have another 50 minute break because a student needs to be taking six classes a semester to be on track for graduation. But having seven periods just gives us a little bit of flexibility. So most students are not taking that full course load and will have a break somewhere else in there during the day. Now you'll notice down at the bottom, we suggest that after school wraps up around 310, you should take a break, you know, go do what you need to do. But that evening, maybe do two or three of the assignments that have been assigned to you so that you don't have to do all of them Tuesday. Just like a regular day of school, do a little bit of homework and get out ahead of things. On Tuesdays, students need to log in at 9.45 to a 15-minute advisory meeting. And the reason for that is that we have to take attendance every day, just like it's normal school. So you can think of that 15-minute meeting kind of like homeroom, where you're going to check in with your advisory teacher. They're going to do a brief focusing activity with you to get you in the right mindset for the rest of the day. And then we suggest about two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon to complete the assignments from Monday. Now we've talked with all of our teachers and we've been doing a lot of work about the idea that the assignments that are given on Monday should take about 20 to 30 minutes each. So we think that that's gonna be a really reasonable amount of time for students to be expected to be able to done with all of their assignments on Tuesday and ready to participate in classes on Wednesday and Thursday. So on Wednesday, only the classes with an A next to them. So you'll notice if some of you have already opened and joined your Google Classrooms, you'll notice that they're all marked with a period that says 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, or 1B, 3B, 4B, or 2B. So on Wednesdays, you're only gonna log into the classrooms that have the A's next to them. So starting at 9:10, we'll have two classes in the morning, each an hour and 15 minutes with a 10 minute break. We'll have a nice hour long break for lunch in the middle of the day. And then in the afternoon, you would join your 3A Google Classroom and your 4A at these times. So again, just like a normal day of school, we would suggest that after those classes, you're gonna receive an assignment in each of them. Complete one or two of them, Wednesday afternoon and evening. Take a nice break after class, make sure you, you decompress, but then do our one or two homework assignments that afternoon or evening, just like during a regular day of school. On Thursdays, you'll notice the bell schedule. We start a bit later, so you got a nice later start to the day. Um, and you'll notice this is also where we add in advisory once more. 
So advisory on Tuesday and Friday is really more of a homeroom, whoops, more of a homeroom check-in. But on Thursdays, we're actually going to be doing activities as a whole group using curriculum from our college counseling prob, uh, platform called Naviance. So on those days, you're actually, this is a really good thing, especially for you as new students to get to know your peers. Um, that period does have a grade and does have a weight, um, an academic weight. Um, but it is not quite the same as like a full on academic class. So our advisory is really about connecting you with your peers, giving you information about if you're in ninth grade, how to navigate homework, how to set deadlines for yourself. If you're an upperclassman viewing this presentation, a lot of it's about college awareness and exploration. Um, but that's what that 2B period that gets added in there. And in Google Classroom, you'll see that marked as the class name will be advisory. So then you got another nice hour long lunch and then your 3B class will meet at these times followed by your 4B class. And then just like Wednesday, we suggest complete one or two assignments Thursday afternoon and evening to make sure you're staying ahead of the curve. Finally, on Friday, a student will log in at 9.45, whoops, uh, for their mandatory advisory meeting, get the right focus for the day, and then spend the morning and the afternoon completing those longer assignments. Now, like I said, those assignments aren't actually due until Monday morning, but we highly recommend that students use their, sorry, my mouse is really sensitive. Um, students use their Fridays to really get out ahead of things and finish up before, you know, so they don't have to do anything over the weekend. But if they are unable to finish, they've got the remainder of the weekend to complete the remaining work where the due dates will be set Monday morning at 8 a.m. So that's sort of a quick overview of our distance learning pro, uh, program. So students will be logging into Google Meet every day, um, seeing, their, seeing one of, at least one of their teachers every day. But the majority of the instruction is happening on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And Tuesdays and Fridays are largely independent with the exception of checking in with their advisor in the mornings. So the next piece I'm going to discuss is grading. Um, how do we assess and grade our students during distance learning? Now, you are all coming from various schools. Some are coming from private schools. Some are coming from district middle schools. People are coming from all over into VIP high school. So I know that a number of schools and districts in the spring adopted a no-fail policy or a your grade cannot go down policy. VIP high school did not do that in the spring. So we see the importance of accountability here and we want families and our students to really understand that the grades during distance learning are binding. Now at the same time, we also think we're pretty reasonable in our approach. So when we asked our returning families, do you feel that the way your students were graded in the spring was fair? As you can see, a very overwhelming majority said yes. We think you're being fair in the way our students are being graded. Um, and that includes families whose students grades may have gone down a little bit. So it's important again to understand that VIP has not adopted a no fail policy and that we very much are holding students accountable and they need to be logging in and doing this work. So let me tell you just a little bit about how that works because it's a little more holistic than you will find in most schools. So in our distance learning program, students are graded in two ways. One way is what's called their weekly grade. So every student receives one grade per class per week. And that is really largely measuring their level of engagement and effort in their distance learning classes. And the way that a student's weekly grade is determined is generally with that rubric below. Now we understand that this does not cover every possible scenario. Um, we've spent a lot of our time in professional development norming our approaches. But what you'll see is that this rubric, um, and a rubric is sort of a guideline for how teachers assign grades. Um, sometimes they use them in projects or they assign points. You'll notice that we have a letter grade scale of A, B, C, F. And it measures three things. One of them is attendance. That's the middle row here. So students have to log in and participate in their Google classes um, every day of the week and especially for the two days of their academic ones um, to be able to do well there. 
So one thing is attendance. You know, the new there's a new state distance learning law that says we need to treat online learning or distance learning exactly the same as in-person learning. So we have to take attendance. We have to report that attendance to the state and students can actually even be truant or chronically absent in a distance learning program if they're not logging into video instruction. So it's very important that I start with emphasizing attendance really matters now. Um, it did in the spring too, but now especially because of the new law, it's extra important. Now you'll notice also the first row is about does the student complete that assignment from Monday or that preparation activity in a timely manner? And the way we, we view that is they need to get it done before their class meets again on Wednesday or Thursday. And then you'll notice that there's sort of like different variations of that for B, C, and F. Finally, the student needs to complete their extension activity, which is the assignment they'll receive at the end of their Wednesday and Thursday class. So depending on how much a student engages during the week, the teacher will assign them a single letter grade. And each weekly grade is worth one point. So for example, if a student participates in their classes both days of the week, because it's an academic class, if they complete their Monday assignment before class meets again, if they thoroughly complete their extension activity before Monday morning, they'll receive an A in that class for the week. And so, I'm sorry, my mouse is very sensitive. I'm sorry the slides keep changing. Jeez, all right. <laughs> and so anyways, the, uh, so back to what we were saying. So every student receives one grade per week per class that really measures these three different components. Now that doesn't mean individual assignments are just gonna be ignored or they'll still be checked. So when students submit things through Google Classroom, they'll have some form of feedback, um, but the weekly grade is what we call a holistic one. It takes into account multiple factors and it's assigned once per week per class. That's the first way. Now, the second way students are graded are on what we call in education summative assessments. These are the assignments that come at the end of a unit of study and evaluate the student's overall level of understanding. So in more simple terms, we've all been to school. Summative assessments are the things like tests, essays, projects, presentations, those bigger assignments that come at the end of a big topic of study. And those, of course, will have their own rubrics and criteria. They'll have their own grade. And the way that they're weighted is equal to the number of weeks in the unit. So for example, that graphic at the bottom of the screen is meant to illustrate it in a little more simply way. So we're evaluating students both on process, their level of engagement, and then final product, their level of understanding. So if I had a four week unit, if I was an English teacher teaching essay writing, and four weeks were spent teaching all of the students the components of writing a solid essay, and then the final project was the essay itself, each week would be worth one point, and if it was four weeks, the final essay would be worth four points. So that places an equal emphasis on both process and product. So 50% of the student's grade is how well they're engaging and keeping up with the individual assignments from week to week, and the other 50% is the big assignments, the tests, the essays, the projects, the presentations. And they have an equal weight with each other. And like we said, overall, overall, our families felt that this was a really fair way to approach grading during distance learning. It also simplifies things a bit for students because there isn't all of these different grading systems and all of these different things to keep track of. Um, normally that's the case. We do allow more flexibility for our teachers when we're in person, but we've completely standardized it. So every teacher is using the exact same system for evaluation. Um, and that helps you with the expectations across the classes. Now parents um, and students, uh, if you're wondering, well, how do I view these grades? Those are gonna be viewable on our student information system, which is called School Pathways. And they have a special uh, sort of portal, this login portal called Parent Portal. Our registrar sent invites to you on Tuesday. So if you didn't see them, make sure you go back and check your emails and also check your spam folders. 
unfortunately, we find that sometimes new families, uh, our messages from school pathways end up in their spam folder. They get flagged for some reason. Um, so make sure you check that folder. And if you see anything from our school or from school pathways or parent portal, make sure you flag that it is not spam. Um, otherwise, it's going to keep going there and you'll miss out on some important updates. So, like I said, I've been kind of surprised and impressed at how many new students have already logged in and set up their emails. They must have read the distance learning handbook we sent out. And that's great. Um, if you haven't, that's great too. And we're going to show you how to do that right now. So for your email, the format for emails is first initial last name at viphs.org. And the password is capital for your first letter, capital F, first name 2020. All right. So if we had a student named Steven Student, their email would be sstudent at viphs.org. And the first time they log in, it would be capital S Steven 2020. Now there are a couple of exceptions to this rule. If you've tried this and you've struggled with it, there are two cases where maybe you might be confused. One is if a student has a hyphenated last name or has two last names. So Maria Espinoza Ramirez would be M Espinoza Ramirez at viphs.org. So no dashes, um, no spaces, no dots, no underscores. Um, so if you have those two last names or a hyphenated last name, realize that they're just put together. The other scenario where that might not work is if your first name is three letters or less. So if your first name is May, um, your login password would not actually be May 2020. It would be your last name 2020. And the reason for that is Google requires at least eight characters for the first password. Um, so if your first name is three letters or less, let's say it's Amy, your password wouldn't be Amy 2020. It would be capital, uh, the first letter capitalized of your last name. So last name 2020. But let me show you what this looks like. So I'm actually going to close this presentation for a moment. And the way you set it up is because we are a Google suite for education school you would actually open a web browser and go to gmail.com. Now you can't do this with the account settings on your phone. So don't try and do it like through the, the apps on your phones. You'll actually have to open a web browser and go to gmail.com. So Steven student would type in his email address. The other error people sometimes run into is they don't add the domain. So you have to put in the entire first part and also at viphs.org. So Steven student is joining VIP high school. He goes to Gmail and enters this and clicks next. Then Steven would type capital S Steven 2020. And then again, click next. You can save it if you want, but I'm not going to. And then you'll see this screen. It'll say, welcome to your new account. Um, you are agreeing to all of these sort of things here. Now, new students, it's very important you understand that as the principal, I am the domain administrator and I have access to your email account. So that should only be used for school related information. The other important point for our incoming families is that at viphs.org account should be shared with you. Uh, if you, so there is no function in Google Classroom where we can add parents to see the exact same thing as their students. So if you want to do that, if you want to be that level of involvement, your student should be sharing that password with you. Um, and again, it's only for school related things. So there's not any privacy or things to worry about in that terms, students, because um, you won't be using it for anything else than school. Um, so it's important to note that, okay? Now there's a, there is a feature of Google Classroom where we can add parents and they can receive sort of an email summary either once a week or once a month. And we'll be doing that during the first and second week of school. You'll receive an invitation at your private emails, um, parents and guardians to sort of have this uh, sort of limited access. But either way, um, after you log in the first time, it'll say, welcome to your new account. You click accept. And of course, sometimes, you know, it'll suggest a password for you. You can reset it to whatever you want. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and use the suggested one and change it. And then my Gmail will open for the first time. 
Now, if it's the first time logging in, what you should notice is there will be a couple of emails, probably, again, depending on how many classes you take, most likely six, that have the subject line that starts with class invitation, all right? So those are your classes, and you'll notice next to them, 3A, 2A, it's going to have the period. Now, Stephen's student so far has only been invited to two classes, AP Seminar and AP World. But what's really great is all you have to do is open that email. And again, all of this is in the distance learning handbook. If I'm moving too quickly, um, if I'm moving too fast, realize all of this information is in our distance learning handbook on how to do all of this stuff, okay? But either way, with your invitations, all you're going to do is click join. A new tab will open up. Oh, and it's asking me for my own email, which is not what I wanted to do. Stephen students. So we'll wait for that to get going. And it's still giving me a problem. Well, this is because I have multiple accounts on my email um, and now that's giving me a little bit of an issue. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, this is what will happen when you click your first invitation, it'll pop up. Um, so you'll have Google Classroom here. That should be your name there. You'll click continue. And of course, you're all going to select I'm a student. So you click I'm a student and you're now in your first class. Now, of course, nothing has been posted yet, so there's nothing really to see. But once school year starts, there's a couple of tabs you should know. One is the stream. And this is sort of like every time a teacher posts something, it's gonna appear at the top. So it's kind of a stream of everything going on. It'll also have due dates over here where it says upcoming. So you'll see when assignments are due, what has been assigned, what you need to complete. But for Monday, the most important thing for you is gonna be this link here. So every Google Classroom that you're gonna join is gonna have its own unique Meet link. So at the time 2A starts, I would open my AP World Modern page and I would click on this link, which will then actually take me to Google Meet, which we use for video conferencing. Now, I'm not gonna go through that right now because the video conference will start to interfere with the one we're in right now, um, but it's pretty self-explanatory. You just click, uh, you'd allow Google Meet to see your webcam and your audio, and then you would just click join now, and then you'll be in a class with your teacher. But realize that it's this link right here that you're gonna use to access those video conferencing classes. So I would definitely suggest that at some point, you either write down this schedule, um, print it off, and this is in the distance learning handbook, but this is tells you when you should be logging into each class. So at 830 on Monday, I would find my 1A Google class, I would open it and I would click on that link. At 920, I would find my 2A class, open it and click on that link to join video conferencing and so on. And that's sort of a quick overview. And so again, I know I keep saying it, but I just want to make sure I emphasize it. All of this information, how to use Google Classroom, how to use Google Meet, um, that's all in our distance learning handbook that we sent to you. Now, there is one thing we want to make sure parents, especially if you're new to Google Classroom, we want to make sure you're aware of this. There is a sort of unique feature of Google Classroom that they have not really fixed. And that is that a student can mark an assignment as done, even if they didn't do the assignment. So right off the bat, new parents, we want you to know that <laughs> If your student isn't getting good grades and you're wondering what's going on and you say, show me your Google Classroom, I want to see if you've been doing the assignments. Your student can open and say, look, see, all of them are marked as done. That itself does not actually indicate they did the assignments. Make sure they open each individual one so that you see if there's actually work attached to it or if they've answered the questions or whatever the assignment was. So that's just a quick note for our parents um, that the turn in your work and also the mark as done button, that's kind of on the honor system. We have had some scenarios in the past where a student was failing a class and we got an angry parent email that said, why is my student failing this class? They showed me Google Classroom and all of their assignments are marked as done. And then we said, well, open those assignments and then you'll see that there's actually nothing attached to them. All right, so that is sort of the basics of how you're gonna activate your email. Um, you'll notice here's another class invitation, same thing, I'm just gonna click join. Um, and then I would be in this class, which is 3A. And so you just make sure that over the next couple of days, you log into your email um, and join those Google Classrooms so that you'll have access to those Google Meet links. So you'll know where to log in 
at the appropriate time. If you're struggling with that, if you can't figure it out, um, please realize you can reach out to us at info at viphs.org and we'll try and troubleshoot it for you. So again, the main issue um, for most students, this should work. The exceptions are students with two last names or a hyphenated last name um, and students with a first name of three or less letters. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, Google Classroom is our learning management system. That along with video conferencing on Google Meet is our primary way that we're delivering our distance learning experience. Um, and we just showed you how to activate your at, at viphs.org account. Um, one more time as a reminder, that account should be accessible by both parent, guardian, and student. At this time, Google Classroom does not support direct parent guardian access, meaning any email that isn't an at viphs.org email can't see the same thing that the student would see. So if you wanna see that exact same thing, um, you would need to log in with the student's account. Um, but we will also add you as the parent guardian access, which basically you have an option of choosing to get weekly summaries. Um, Google Classroom will send you a weekly summary of your students' work and what they've done, um, or you can actually set it up to be monthly as well. Now, moving on to some more general issues. Um, primarily, this is for parents and guardians. There are three main ways that we communicate with you. Those three things are called Parent Square, the VIP Voice, and Naviance. Parent Square is integrated with School Pathways and Reg Online. That's where you're completing all of your enrollment paperwork. And this is a way for us to directly send you, parents and guardians, texts, emails, and even automated phone calls to the email accounts and phone numbers you provided during registration. So we find that sometimes parents and guardians may have, you know, two or three different email addresses. Realize that we are sending them to the ones that you used during registration, okay? Because um, sometimes we've gotten notices from families that said, well, we're not getting any updates, and it's because it was going to the email they used during registration, but not the one they sort of regularly use during their day-to-day -day life. And when they went and checked that other email, oh, they noticed there's all the communications. So these are pointed communications directed only at our own parent body, um, and primarily we use the text messaging system for attendance issues and things that are urgent. So for example, on Monday, if your student doesn't log into a Google Meet class, at the end of the day, you're going to receive a text message that your student missed one or more classes. And that's a way that we make sure that you, the parents and guardians, are kept informed of whether your students are doing the things that they need to do. Now, we have two front office uh, workers. Their names are Myra Monroy. She is our attendance officer and Magali Vasquez. She's our front office receptionist. So if you've called the school recently, Magali is the first person you've, you've come in contact with. So they're the people you'll most likely hear from with phone calls and text messages. Now, the second way we contact you is called the VIP voice. I think all of you are already signed up for it. Um, I think we sign up all of our new families automatically. And that is just a general information newsletter that's kind of just for the public at large. It's mostly a way for us to celebrate the things going on at school and advertise to the world. You know, here's why VIP high school is a great place to go to school. And so we have a couple thousand subscribers to that. Um, it's not an urgent communication, but we definitely encourage you to still read it, uh, you know, by Monday afternoon. So we send out the VIP voice on Sundays. And so, you know, it's not as urgent. It's not like a parent square. It's not, oh my God, I need to read this right away. But you should still check it out because it's a way to kind of understand that here's what's going on at my child's school and here are the good things that are happening and here are events that are coming up. So that information, again, it comes to you on Sundays. Occasionally it does go to people's spam folders. So if you haven't been getting the VIP voice, make sure you check your spam folder and mark it as not spam. Finally, the last way we contact you is through a platform called Naviance. Now, freshmen and sophomore families, this is not something you really need to be that concerned about. You probably won't be receiving communications from Naviance. Naviance is our college counseling and application platform. So Naviance communications are gonna be directed a lot more frequently to juniors and seniors. So the reason we send them through Naviance is that each student's Naviance account will also keep copies of those emails. So they're very easy to access later on and they have lots of information about what's going on with college counseling and the college application process. So those are our three primary ways of staying in touch with you. 
parent squares are generally important and should be read right away. The VIP voice, while still important, is not urgent. Again, it's sort of more of a general newsletter, but you should still be reading it. And finally, if you're the parent of an incoming junior or senior, if you see something from Naviance, that's going to be important because that's going to have college-related communications um, and information about upcoming things that are going on. Uh, and like I mentioned, you may also be getting phone calls and texts from our front office staff. Um, during distance learning, teachers are going to be regularly reporting out on the level of student engagement, whether they're attending classes. And so if they're not doing what they need to be doing, you're going to hear from us, okay? So that's just to make sure that we're staying on top of students and keeping them engaged with this process. So finally, uh, if you are able to screenshot this would probably be the time but again we'll include this in the VIP voice on Sunday as a reminder so who to contact all right this is important so attendance during distance learning is now the same as attendance during in-person schooling so that means that student absences are marked excused or unexcused we have to take attendance of our students every day now the same rules also apply for excused absences. So if your student has a doctor's appointment on Tuesday and can't make it to advisory in the morning, all you have to do is make sure you reach out to our attendance officer and explain the reason for the absence ahead of time so that we can make sure that it's excused and the teachers know. So any issues related to attendance, including absences, Myra Monroy at mmonroy at viphs.org is the person to reach out to, or the school phone number at 818-306-2136. Many of you are still finishing up registration in Reg Online, or you've done that over the summer. So anything related to registration, Reg Online, and student records, that's our registrar. Her name is Addie Guzman. You can reach her at aguzman at viphs.org. Issues related to school pathways and parent portal, that's where you access grades. You should have received invites on Tuesday. You can reach out to Usha Baxter at ubaxter at viphs.org. It's also important to note that Usha is our dean and during distance learning, she regularly joins all of the distance learning classes to monitor student behavior. So if she joins a distance learning class and your student is being disruptive, you very well may hear from her and we may end up having to talk about some consequences. So she logs into all of the classes pretty regularly just to keep an eye on things and make sure that students are following distance learning etiquette. If you have a question about counseling or student support, that's Stephanie Riley. Um, she is our academic counselor. You can reach her at sriley at viphs.org. And finally, academic questions. So our chain of command is you have a question about a class, the first person to reach out to is the teacher of that class. Then the student's advisory teacher. So if you're unable to sort it out with the teacher themselves, you'll reach out to your student's advisory teacher who is your student's advocate in the building. And finally, if that's not working, you would reach out to Stephanie Riley at sriley at viphs.org because she's our academic counselor. So in other words, if you have a question about a grade, the first person you should contact is the teacher. They have the most information and they're gonna to have to be part of any solution. Uh, so just this as an example. And so at this point, I am going to wrap up my portion and I'm going to throw it to our assistant principal, Catherine Wilbert, who I just have to quickly unmute here. And Catherine Wilbert's gonna talk just a little bit about um, some changes to our AP program and uh, some issues related to advisory. So Catherine, take it away. Hello, uh, I'm Catherine Wilbert and I'm the assistant principal. I also teach math. This year I'm teaching AP statistics and also the AP seminar course, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, I'm excited to meet all of you and glad that you're joining us, even though it's uh, from your computers. So uh, an exciting new thing for this year is that we were approved to be an AP capstone school. So that means that this year we're piloting a new course at our school uh, called AP Seminar. And next year we'll pilot the second course in the sequence called AP Research. And these are two interdisciplinary courses developed by the College Board to, um, to help students develop critical skills for college level work. So we'll be working on things like critical thinking, research, collaboration, time management, presentation skills, sort of all those 
uh, other skills that go along with the academic content. Uh, and the exciting thing about the AP Capstone program is that if students score a three or higher on six total AP exams, so the AP seminar and AP research exams, and then four additional AP exams uh, in high school, they actually graduate with an AP Capstone diploma. Um, so that's a new exciting program that we have and we're really excited to see uh, how it goes in its first year. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, so it, in talking about AP exams, our AP exam policy is that all students who are enrolled in AP classes are encouraged to take the AP exam in May. Uh, it's a great experience for students and it can earn them college credit, uh, which is always very useful. Um, and then students will receive weighted GPA for that course only if they actually sit for the exam. And you'll have to register for the exams in October. That's when the College Board sets the deadline. So you'll look for information in the VIP Voice and the Parent Square in October about how to register for those AP exams. So switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk a little more about our advisory program, which is something we've been really trying to uh, build over the last few years. Advisory is really the sort of home base for students at school. It is the place where they have an adult who's going to follow them, their advisor, from ninth grade through 12th grade. And that person really becomes the student's advocate uh, at school. And if they need anything, that's the teacher that they tend to go to. Um, so this year, advisory is actually going to be a graded course. And it's worth two and a half credits per semester. Uh, most courses are five credits per semester. Uh, advisory will be five for the whole year because it meets only about half as much time. Um, and the big goals of advisory are culture building, getting students to know each other, uh, working around some of those softer skills that students need to be successful in high school and beyond, um, and also the college counseling piece. Um, so we'll spend a lot of time in advisory using the Naviance curriculum, which is a, uh, a website and a program that we purchase as a school and it helps students to think through all those steps that get them from high school and into college. Um, and then again, just as a reminder, your advisory teacher for both students and parents is your sort of first point of contact. Um, we often encourage kids to go talk to their teachers if they're having an issue, but sometimes we find that students aren't really sure what to say to their math teacher, maybe. And so the advisor is a great person to talk to, and your advisor can help you think about how should I ask for the help that I need in my math class, um, and the same is true for parents. So whoever that teacher is in your advisory, they will be your advisor for the next four years, so get to know them. Thank you, Catherine. And of course, everyone, you notice I made that quick change during the middle of the presentation. Uh, advisory meets every Thursday during the 2B two period, two period, but also Tuesdays and Fridays at 945. That was a recent adjustment we had to make for purposes of attendance, um, but also to really get students focused for the day by checking in with their adult advocate in the building. Next, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Ann Cochran, who will be discussing the college counseling programs, and then some issues related to special education. So Anne, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Glad to see you tonight. And we're really excited you chose us. Thank you. I think you'll be pleased with your school choice. And I want you to let any of us know at any point when we can do anything to make you more comfortable and happier. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I uh, like, I think everyone in administration wears several hats. In my case, I wear three hats, and I'll tell you about the first one. The first one is I direct the school's college counseling program. Um, I'll just say that if you want to have great college choices by the time you graduate from high school with lots of support along the way, you've certainly come to the right place. Um, you probably know by now that college choice is the foundation of our program at VIP, and it's why LAUSD authorized 
our charter, our school to even exist. So what happens, the overview of it is in ninth grade, you know, don't worry too, too much about if, um, college at this point. You will start to receive uh, what we call college knowledge and career exploration as a group-centered activity in your advisory groups. You'll be assigned an, a Naviance account. You'll start working in it right away. Um, we are most concerned uh, when you're a new high school student about you adjusting to the demands of high school first and also the social environment. And that's going to be, you know, particularly interesting in this uh, distance learning environment that we're currently in. And um, so in order to make college eventually happen, our first needs are to make sure you have a great and effective high school experience. So you'll be helped a lot in understanding and planning um, your coursework as you go and your graduation requirements and parents. You will be introduced to financial aid principles as early as September of this year. That's going to happen. So look for an email that will arrive shortly after Labor Day about that. Um, second of all, 10th grade, if we have any new 10th graders and 11th graders, um, like freshman year, it will all be group centered in advisory, that's college counseling, but we'll be turning up the heat a lot on that information. And you'll see that it, it, it gets more intensive as it goes. The second half of 11th grade, you will start meeting with me individually for the first time so that we can work together to plan your college application journeys and choices. And all the while advisory, the group-centered work still continues. And then all of senior year, uh, we are family members. <laughs> you, you and I will get to know each other quite well. Uh, you'll work with me individually. You'll work with, um, certainly with Miss Wilbert and Miss Riley. They play a big role as well. We're a team and Mr. Horn as well. We're, we're a, we've, we're, we've learned to become a tight team. So you'll um, have different interactions with each of us about college, but I'm sort of at the helm of that whole experience. I think I will say our college results are the best you will find in any Valley public school. I will even go as far as to say we send our kids to colleges at a comparable rate and the same arrays of colleges that you'll see happening at most high-end private schools in our area. So you've come, you've made a good choice. It's uh, uh, no tuition, but with essentially the same level of service and outcome. Um, Naviance was mentioned. You won't know that it, if you get an email from me, most likely it is coming through Naviance. It won't be identified as such. It's just gonna look like a regular email. But again, I work through that system for college-centered um, communication so that it is stored in your Naviance account for, for future reference. So um, that's college in a nutshell. I look forward to getting to know all of you. The second hat I have just started wearing is the one of um, special ed oversight at the school. Um, if you will be enrolled in our special education program, know that I am the administrator of record who will usually sign, uh, attend and sign off on IEPs as well as carry forth LAUSD related, you know, relations and communication. However, your frontline one-on-one -on -one contact is not me. It's with one of our two fabulous, and I mean fabulous resource specialists, Mr. Riano and Ms. Conival. If you are needing 504 assistance, I know some of you know what that is and some don't, and that's okay. But um, if that is your case, that area of activity is handled by Ms. Riley, who you'll meet in a minute. She's our school counselor. So IEPs go through Mr. Riano and Ms. Conival and the 504s through Ms. Riley. 
Um, I know they're in the process of reach, doing initial phone calls to, to families who are uh, who fall into these um, categories of interest. So if you haven't yet heard from them, know it's coming shortly. And then finally, my third hat is as the school's overall executive director and co-founder. Um, that's a long story that we're not gonna do tonight, but um, I have many other duties that involve district oversight and various related legalities and contracts and headaches of that sort, as well as school marketing tasks. I will, uh, I do wanna say quite happily, we are still marching forward to moving into the new building in Southeast Northridge at the beginning of the year. We're very excited about that. Uh, it's under construction right now. So far, everything is swimming along, knock on wood. And um, we have nothing but good news about that front at this time. I hope you've been following that in Facebook. And, follow, and finally, I just wanna add a word. We have a wonderful, parent organization that is separate and apart from the school called Friends of Parents in Partnership. That's a mouthful, that's a long story about how that name came up, but suffice it to say, it's our parent booster club. We have a very capable and fantastic president named Heather Weingarten, I'm sure some of you know her. So um, if you receive mailings from them, um, please participate, That's uh, we need you, and they need you. So um, know that you'll be receiving communications from them as well. And now I'm going to throw it over to our very much loved school counselor, who you're gonna love to, Stephanie Riley. Thank you. Hi everyone, I know you can't say hi back, but I just wanted to say hi. I'm Miss Riley, I'm a school counselor. Um, I am excited to hopefully meet you through our Google Meet system and also through email to those of you that I've already spoken to. Um, so here is just a few ways to get a hold of me since you don't have actual classes with me. Oh. Um, the first way is through the, my Tuesday at 3 p.m. I'll be holding office hours as well. So for students, along the way throughout the weeks if you start having um, things that come up that you need to ask me questions then you can always join my google meet it'll be from 3 to 4 p.m you don't have to make an appointment for that you just log on and and we work out whatever you need to work out the next way to get a hold of me for parents and students is to book an appointment through um, the you can book me link there that direct that links up directly to my calendar so as soon as you make an appointment i get a notification and you're on my calendar um, if i ever need to reschedule or anything i'll let you know but um what's next so schedule changes uh as michael uh, mr horn was mentioning if you've already logged into your student email and you saw that you started getting invites to your google classrooms that's great and if you haven't logged in yet please do that so you can start seeing since because you should have all of your invites to your classes so far that way you can see your schedule if you have any um, errors in your schedule meaning you were placed in two English classes or you're missing uh, your biology science class or something where it's a very clear error that we've made please do reach out to me and Miss Wilbert so that we can correct that issue as soon as possible if you have any preference changes though, like you don't like the, select, the, the um, electives that you were placed in or maybe some other um, preference for your schedule, you will have to wait for those types of changes until the for end of the first week of school. So in your Thursday advisory class of the first week, you'll receive um, information on how you can change, request to change your schedule. And those, the Google form that you'll fill out will be due the following Thursday of the next week and we'll get those schedule changes um, done as quickly as possible. Um, Mr. Horn may have mentioned it, but just so you know, if you do request a schedule change and it is change and it's a preference, um, certain courses are already full and may stay full and we do have to keep them at a low, uh, low number in case we ever do return to campus. We can't have too many students in each room. Um, so let's see what else am I covering? Oh, um, Another thing that I wanted to just mention is that you will uh, soon receive an email 
from me and probably also a parent square notification that we are having a um, woman come in from a nonprofit organization who is going to be running a weekly group. I still have to confirm the day and time that's called healthy relationships for teens. And that's going to be um, an hour or so long once a week. And so we'll get that information coming out soon with a parent consent form and more information about that. But I just wanted to give you a heads up because it will be coming. Um, and I think that is all for me. And I look forward to meeting you all. Thank you, Ms. Riley. So we've had just a couple of questions that seem to be popping up over the last week or so. And so we're going to round out our presentation with just some of the most common questions that we've been getting. Now, again, if, if you have a question that hasn't been answered this evening, you can always reach out to us at info at viphs.org. And then that email will get forwarded to the appropriate staff member to answer. So Obviously, as Ms. Riley just mentioned, the most common question we've been getting um, both from new and returning students is how do I change my schedule? So as we mentioned, um, if it's a clear error, go ahead and feel free to email Ms. Riley and Ms. Wilbert, our assistant principal. But if it is just a preference issue, realize go to, your go to the classes on your schedule for the first week. We'll send out a form on that Friday, so a week from tomorrow. Now again, um, I'm going to reemphasize it as well. You do need to keep in mind that we have to keep class sizes small for when we return to campus. The County Health Department has very stringent guidelines for school reopening um, that involve a lot of social distancing. So you might hear from your friend that a class only has 20 students. Um, and so, you know, you might be, well, why can't I be in that class? Well, we need to keep the class size small because we've determined in our new building that only 20 students will be able to fit in the appropriate social distancing requirements. So just keep that in mind um, that we do need to keep our class sizes smaller than usual. Sometimes our more popular electives can get up close to 30 and sometimes a few kids over, but we just can't do that this year. So we hope you aren't disappointed by any of the, the classes. We think if you give them a chance, you're gonna enjoy them. Um, but realize we may not be able to honor people's preferences as much as we normally do because of the plan to return to campus. Uh, so another question I've gotten is because as you have noticed, our weekly sequences are pretty self-contained. Um, and so another question has come up of how does grading work for students with IEPs, um, particularly if they have, have extended time accommodations. So that is a question that will be answered by your student's case manager. And we have some pretty good communication between our case managers and our teachers. So they'll work with teachers to determine the appropriate amount of time that work can be accepted. What we did in the spring oftentimes was to substitute the extended time for a reduced workload so that the student can keep up with the pace of the class. Because obviously with distance learning and the sequence we've set out, it's much better for students to keep up the pace of the class than take extra time to turn in work. Uh, a question we've gotten is, is attendance to video instruction mandatory? Yes. As I mentioned, there is a new state distance learning law, SB 98, that requires us to report attendance to distance learning the same as if we were meeting in person. So realize missing distance learning classes without a valid reason is an unexcused absence and we do put our students' attendance records on their transcripts. So when it does come time to apply for college, your attendance record shows up on there, and that's something that colleges value. So again, attendance, regular attendance is very important. And of course, in those events that you have a valid reason, if there's an excused absence, we will excuse it, but we need you to reach out to Myra Monroy and let her know ahead of time why your student's going to be absent that day. Sometimes Myra may even need to ask you for some documentation. Oops. Um, so some questions I've gotten that probably predate this evening. Where are the links for classes posted? As I mentioned, they are on each individual Google Classroom. Um, in the spring, we had a crazy system where there was like dozens of links to different Zoom classes. But now, um, because Google Meet is integrated with Google Classroom and all of its other apps, it's very easy. You just go to your class classroom and then just click on the link and then you're in class. Finally, the last question was, does the school sign out technology if we do not have a computer at home? Yes, we've done that. Um, we actually sent out a technology survey on August 4th. Uh, if you didn't have time to find it um, or you didn't have a chance to fill it out, you can reach out to us at 818-306-2136. Um, today, we had a technology distribution from one to two. 
and we'll be doing it again tomorrow. Miss Riley, what time are we talking? Are we looking there for that? I have to unmute you just one second. All right, that's not working. Miss Riley, hold up on hold up how many fingers? What what time? Ten o'clock. Is that correct? Thumbs up? Okay. So ten o'clock. But again, please call us in advance though. Don't just show up at ten. We need to take down your information so that we can make sure we've documented that we're sharing technology with you. Um, now we are uh, purchasing some hotspots. Um, there is a backlog for all things distance learning related in all companies in all areas. Um, so it doesn't look like we're going to have those for next week. It's probably going to take about two, possibly even three weeks for us to get some of those Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, but we will have a limited number that we can share with folks as well. Um, so again, if you can find the distance learning survey, that would be ideal. If you need to call the school, you can do so at that number. Um, and again, we'll take down your information and, our, and uh, your needs, and we'll do our best to set up a time that we can help you out. So that pretty much wraps up our evening. Um, one thing you should know is that, again, this has been recorded. We will post this video on YouTube and send you the link um, at some point tomorrow. Um, so if there's any section of it that was moving a little too quickly or you'd like to go back and review, you'll have access to a recording of this presentation. But again, most of this information is covered in our distance learning handbook. Um, it's an appendix to our regular parent student handbook. So all of the little technical aspects of Google Classroom and how to use Google Meet and the etiquette that we expect, um, grading policies, office hours, all of those types of things are in our distance learning handbook. So if you haven't looked at that yet, make sure you take some time to go through that one more time and review all of the information. So at this point, we just wanted to thank you again so much for coming this evening. If you have any further questions, feel free to send them to info at vihs.org. And we're really excited for you to join our community. And we think you're gonna find that our distance learning experience is, is pretty great. Um, we got great reviews from our parents in the spring, um, especially who had ones in multiple schools. And we think you made the right choice and we're really glad for you to be joining our community. So have a great evening. Um, our teachers are so excited to meet all of the students on Monday morning. So just make sure you take some time to review the information you'll need to be successful and hit the ground running starting Monday morning at 8.30. Have a great night and thank you so much.